Oh, good afternoon, everybody. You've probably heard the expression that the only constant in the world today is change. Luckily, that's not true. There are lots of things that are constant, including the sun coming up to greet us every day. And we know that that's going to happen for at least another set several billions of years. The other things that we know that are really, I think, fundamental in terms of how we understand our world is that our relationship to our world vis-a-vis -vis the sun is changing. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Namely, how a revolution in solar power is not only changing technology and the way we understand it, but also how it's changing ourselves. And it's also a call for action. We'll get to that in a moment. So first, a little bit of context. Let's talk about what we're not <laughs> going to talk about today, or at least not directly. We are not going to talk about climate change. How many people with a show of hands here believe that climate change is real and that is caused by us? Virtually 100% of the audience. Virtually 100%. Yes. Well, we're not going to talk about this phenomena because, guess what? We've known about it for more than 140 years. We know that it has significant impacts on many different ecosystems on the planet Earth. And we know that it's not actually abating or reducing in any way. In fact, it's accelerating in spite of the fact that many countries around the world, with some notable exceptions like Canada, are making significant strides to develop renewable energy portfolios. So we're not going to talk about that. It's too depressing. We're not going to talk about the fact that this fusion reactor in the sky, this incredible star that's the center of our solar system, produces the equivalent amount of energy in 20 days as all the known reserves of coal, oil, and natural gas. Think about that for a second. We've got so much potential to use this energy, yet Canada is still building pipelines. We're not going to talk about the solar technology itself, although I'm going to show you lots of wonderful pictures of what we've done. But I do want to mention a few things. Solar, like a lot of technologies, is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, a lot of people have said to me, they don't want to see their cities littered, and that's their terminology, with solar panels on rooftops. Yet, if you travel around the world, for example, if you go to a lot of villages in many European countries, you'll see solar panels like this coexisting quite beautifully with very old buildings, with old structures. And you also need to know that there are one million solar panels installed around the world every day. Every single day. And that countries like Bangladesh have 15 million homes that are powered with solar currently, which is about 10% of all their homes. If you look around Kamloops, you might be lucky to see a half dozen. And we have some of the best solar power in the country. So I decided a few years ago to try to change this um, and to try to deal with many of the misperceptions and misunderstandings of the technology. And initially, about four years ago, with a team of uh, people, I created a nonprofit called Gabe Energy. And Gabe Energy's goal at that time was to provide solar equipment and design consultation at an extremely reasonable rate. I got this going for one very specific reason. I wanted solar on my own house. Uh, and I went around to various companies, and I had heard and had read that solar power equipment had declined by 90% in price in the last decade. Yet, much to my surprise, and I have to say disgust, when I went out and got quotes, that wasn't true. It may have been true from the supplier side, but those savings were not being translated and accruing to the client eventually. So we created this nonprofit, and to do that, I needed to make sure <laughs> that this was feasible and that it could work, and I understood how it worked. So I went onto eBay and I found a solar supplier 
uh, who sold me modules. I found another supplier who sold me some inverter technology to convert the DC energy from the modules to AC, which is what your house uses. And I went to a local junkyard, got some old bed rails, some angle iron, and fashioned it into modules for the roof. And the quotes that I was getting for five solar modules with all of that equipment ranged between ten and fourteen thousand dollars. I ended up doing it for two thousand dollars. It was clear at that point that there was a gap, a gap between reality and expectation. Uh, so we started the nonprofit. Two years ago, I moved on and created my own company called Sweet Spot Solar, which does projects like this. So this is a, um, a project in uh, Rayleigh. Um, this uh, client here wanted to be almost carbon neutral in terms of the energy that they use and what they produce. So they have 16 solar modules on their roof. Uh, this makes a system that is close to 5,000 watts in power. The equipment, just to give you an idea of what's actually happening nowadays, the equipment for this system was less than $10,000. The installation was another three to four. And now they make all the power that they need. And it's all without batteries. It's all being fed back to the grid through something called net metering. Other clients have done um, different kinds of things. So for instance, uh, this particular project here was at, at, at one point in time, the second largest solar array for residents in British Columbia. This one's on East Shushwap Road. It has 136 modules on the ground. And this client, with um, the help of his friends, did all the racking work, put the concrete foundations in, and bought the equipment, and now makes the equivalent of what four households would use. And you'll see that it uh, works quite well and quite seamlessly with the environment. This is the biggest and uh, up until a point, one of the most complicated ones that we did. This is up in the west side area in a little community called Black Pines. And it's a, a tracker. This is called a dual axis tracker. It actually follows the sun. And it changes its tilt throughout the time of the year so that it maximizes its um, gain from the sun. And it also follows the sun throughout the day like a sunflower. And it has one other special feature. The modules that are on it are something called bifacial modules. Bifacial meaning that they can actually make power on both sides of the module. Power that hits the top, obviously, but also the incident light, the albedo effect that comes through the back, produces energy at the same time. So a system like this can make the equivalent of about three to four houses use of electricity. Well. That was a hard project, and it was uh, technically challenging. It was expensive, for sure. Uh, but it was nothing compared to what we got into later on. This is Canada's first solar sidewalk system here on campus. And this little uh, prototype of 16 solar modules, that's our electrician Amy Schellenberg's, uh, one of her daughters, uh, walking on this. It's in front of the daycare center here on campus is Canada's first solar sidewalk. Nobody has tried this. I guess they were smart enough to realize that there were too many pitfalls and obstacles and barriers, including the fact that uh, the electrical code really doesn't deal well with this kind of application. So we had to do a lot of pioneering work and development and in installation and getting approvals. So these were donated to the university by a company in Vancouver called Solar Earth Technologies. And they worked with our team here at TRU and with our community partner, the BC Sustainable Energy Association, and other general members of the public who wanted to participate to get this going last summer. This was done in the height of the smoke, so it was a little bit um, <laughs> uncomfortable, but it uh, works beautifully. Well, as I said, it was the prototype. It was the baby version for this project here called the Solar Compass. Uh, you'll find our website at solarcompass.ca. This project, as well as Solar Sidewalk, was funded by the university in partnership with the, these companies that donated equipment. And this is a complicated geometry, um, very complicated in terms of the way it had to be interconnected and all the technology had to come together. But now it is part of Canada's first larger solar path and sidewalk system. Our next goal is to see if we can actually uh, ruggedize this material for road application. My dream, 
especially what's uh, been happening in some parts of the province recently, is to have a rainbow sidewalk across a campus or something like that made out of multicolored solar panels that actually produce power. So we'll do that. We'll get to that stage. But it's important to note that the revolution in solar power is accompanied by other technological revolutions, including uh, solar ele uh, electric vehicles. Uh, this is my Chevrolet Volt. Um, I picked this up about a year ago. Uh, it costs me $1.50 in electricity to drive 100 kilometers. These cars are excellent. All electric cars are incredibly smooth, quiet, very low pollution, uh, and very affordable to operate. And right now in British Columbia, something called the Scrap It program, if you turn in an older car, you can get $12,000 off an electric car. With those incentives, this car actually would cost less than a gasoline counterpart. And I drove it the other day on the Coquihalla in hell. And I've never driven a vehicle that handled snow and rough conditions as well as an electric vehicle. I've had four-wheel drives, SUVs, you name it. And the fine micro-control of the motors, combined with the, the traction control of the motors when you're going down the hill, unbeatable. So most of you believe that we, as a species, are responsible for climate change. Show of hands, how many people in the audience have a solar array on their house? I see two, maybe. How many people in the audience drive an electric vehicle? I see two or three. There's a, a gap. There is a problem that's sometimes referred to in psychological literature and in other fields. The attitude, behavior, there is a break in the bridge between what we believe in and what we va our values are aligned on and what we actually do. And it's most noticeable when you look at some of the really low-hanging, cost-effective, proven technologies like solar and electric vehicles, and you look at the fact that they're just not taking off here. And I have lots of reasons uh, for this, and some of it comes from um, my work meeting with potential solar clients. People say things like, we decided that um, our family had other priorities, uh, or we need a new vehicle, or the furnace is on its last leg, or we're getting old, we're not sure we're going to live long enough to have it pay itself off, and on and on and on. There are literally dozens of excuses that people have for not embracing the technology, even when the cost of the electricity that you make off your array is less than the current price of electricity you pay through BC Hydro. People still aren't doing it. And that's puzzling to me. And uh, there's lots of um, dialogue out there, and there's lots of misunderstandings of the technology. A lot of the people that were originally solar, say, maybe back as far as the 1970s or 1980s, and they have this, this old way of thinking about the technology. The old baggage is still there. And it's incredibly hard to uh, dislodge. Other reasons, and this one actually took away my breath a little bit, was somebody said to me after we went through a very comprehensive review of their potential, which was fantastic. We could have put their entire house carbon neutral for about $15,000 too. We don't want to be one of the first in our neighborhoods to do it because we don't want to be seen as those kind of people, those greeny kind of people. They were afraid of the perception of somehow being a hippie or something like that if they did solar. And we've had neighborhoods, entire communities, by the way, like Sun Rivers, where I live in town, that have systematically attempted to block solar. There's only two solar arrays in all of Sun Rivers, simply because perhaps somebody doesn't like the look of them on their rooftop of a neighbor's house. So these are some of the barriers, but there's some other deeper psychological and cultural barriers as well. One is something I call toxic masculinity. It has to do with the fact that there are a group of men out there, of all ages by the way, who see green technologies, electrification of vehicles, organic food, vegetarianism, you name it, anything that you might color as progressive, as somehow an affront to their testicles. <laughs> and I'll give you an example of that. Um, Hyundai just brought out, they just announced that they have a, an SUV, it looks wonderful, uh, called the Kona. It's a 100% electric SUV. 
This is something people have been asking for for a long time, that has a range of almost 500 kilometers and affordable to the masses. And I was looking at a popular mechanics of car website, I won't say which one, to read commentary, um, I'll call it the echo chamber, of people who immediately jumped on the car, many of them who probably never even sat in an electric car, attacking it as Korean junk, I'd like to crush that, does it come in diesel? And there were hundreds and hundreds of comments like that in this echo chamber. So we have a problem with toxic masculinity. What we really need to do is get set outside of our box and be innovative. And I want to give you an example of something that I'm doing right now, which is difficult, but by no means impossible. A lot of people have perceptions of technologies like solar and perhaps wind that are again colored by those who would prefer to muddy the waters. Uh, wind is a really good example of that. You've probably heard that wind turbines slice up birds. Well, some do. There's no question about that. But they're not all equal in the way they act. Uh, here's a wind turbine. It's called a vertical axis wind turbine. I've just put two of these actually on my pro one of my properties on the coast. These two wind turbines, uh, very low cost, uh, designed in Italy spin at a relatively slow speed, will make enough power to power my electric car for a year, driving 20,000 kilometers. And the technology is this. This is the motor, 1,000 watt motor in each, about the size of a coffee cup. So, a test for you, with respect to your thinking, and my last point. I have this idea. Imagine if we were to circle the Earth with solar modules, kind of like what Donald Trump wants to do with the wall across Mexico. And we were to do that in such a way, with the right latitudes and the right amount of them, so that no matter where the world, wherever the world was with respect to the sun, we would always be producing power. I call this the solar spiral. Is your first reaction, this is the test in my last point, this is impossible, this is impractical, who would do this, there are geopolitical borders, without even thinking about whether it could be done? If so, you and I, and everybody who tends to have a negative response to new ideas at first, is the problem. Why are we giving up on a sustainable future without even trying? Why are we giving up on a sustainable dream without even making an effort? When the opposite, the natural outcome of that is a nightmare. Thank you very much.